Welcome back to the mysterious city of Darktown. For those of you making your first visit to this ostensibly ordinary Midwestern city, you're in for one or two surprises. On our last visit to Darktown, we stayed on the outskirts in the woods surrounding the city, and we encountered strange cases of the supernatural and unexplained. Today, we venture back to the heart of the city on our quest to uncover murder. In the first of tonight's three stories, we join a man who has a little time to reflect on the decisions of his past and how they have led him to his current predicaments. Five minutes. That's how much air I have left in here. Give or take a few seconds, of course. I don't have access to a clock to see how long I've been in here. I do know this room holds enough air for roughly ten minutes total, once sealed completely. I wasted my first five minutes trying to escape, a feat I am well aware is impossible, and actually quite stupid. I've resigned myself to this fate, unless she has a change of heart, which is doubtful to say the least. She caught me completely by surprise. I'm almost in awe of her planning. I never once suspected she was anything other than what she appeared to be. I guess that's why they say you should be cautious of who you meet online. Four minutes now. That's if I can remain calm. I know what to expect, but will it keep me from pounding my fists against the door when my chest gets tight? Who knows? We'll see soon, I guess. She knew just how to cater to my tastes. Blonde hair, blue eyes, goth chick. Something about the light, dark contrast appeals to me. It helped that she looked familiar. I couldn't quite place who she was at first. She played a good role and got the best of me. She knew just how to make me feel comfortable. How to stroke my ego and lull me into a false sense of security. She seemed fragile, broken, and desperate. <laughs> just how I like them. I guess she just seemed easy. Three minutes. I don't know if it's in my mind, or if my breaths are becoming harder to pull into my lungs, and less satisfying once they get there. It's only a matter of time now, anyway. She was so charming to me. So sweet and humble. But she held that broken air about her. Like she would do anything I told her to. I even considered asking her to join me in my work. As an assistant of sorts. She was just so damn obedient. Not like the others before her. She didn't try to run off or act like a bitch to me. I think that's what did it. That's what made me let my guard down. So young and beautiful. My old eyes were blinded by lust and strangely hope for the future. Hope that she would be the one that I could keep, teach and mold into the perfect life mate. Life can get lonely for a man of my tastes. Two minutes now. There's no denying that the oxygen level is dropping. My chest is starting to burn and panic is clawing at my brain, insisting I try again, insisting if I plead long enough she'll open the door. I've kept it at bay so far. I know pleading won't work. She sees me for what I am. We'd been dating for a few weeks when that feeling of deja vu I got with her started to really pick at my brain. 
it practically overwhelmed me. But in my line of work, questioning these things can get pretty messy. If I do happen to recognize someone I knew before, well, that's just something best left unsaid. I finally placed her at the last second, right before she sealed me in here. She had wandered into my study as I slept opened this hatch, and then waited for me to come looking for her. How had she slipped from her restraint so easily? How had she known where to find the secret lash to release this hidden vault? These are questions that will haunt me now, in this final minute or so of my life. The air is hot now, thick and almost completely devoid of oxygen. My chest is burdened by an unbelievable weight, and black dots shower my vision. It won't be long now. Such a shame that I didn't recognize her face just a day sooner. It would have been her in here, struggling to breathe her last. But it's too late to think of what could have been. There's barely even time to think of what is. She hid in wait until I was in place, staring perplexed at the open vault. Then she made her move, knocking me over the head and shoving me in here. I only just had time to turn around and glimpse her face, framed by the doorway, eyes flaming with hatred. Only then did I realize where I'd seen that face before. Years ago, she was my first. I was young, reckless. I know now that I was also too kind. I forced her inside this same vault that will come to be my tomb. But I let the little girl live. She couldn't have been but three years old. There's no way that she could have incriminated me, and at the time killing a child was a little too much to stomach. So, I drugged her blindfolded her, and left her on the side of the road a hundred miles away. I'd never known what had become of her, until now. My final thought, as my vision fades, and my chest feels about to explode, is of those same hate-filled eyes, staring up at me, from the face of her mother. Ah, they say we never forget a face, and how true that seems to be. Pity was a little bit too late for him. And now we move on to a family of four brothers who are rejoicing in the excitement of a huge lottery win. But, as we are in Darktown, we'll see that not everything ends well. Three years ago I won the lottery, and within four months, I'd learned to never trust anyone. My three brothers, Jerry, Paul and Joseph, and I won the Powerball lottery. We claimed it anonymously, and split the $399.4 million between the three of us. Of course, after taxes, we only took away around $71 million each. Every week for 10 years, we'd been throwing in $50 a person. Some weeks we'd win a couple of hundred dollars, but others we'd only take a couple of dollars. Despite losing money, we would still throw in the same $50 week after week without a second thought. The very hope that, someday, we might be able to just live comfortably without having a job was more than enough motivation for us. So that's why we never gave up, or even gave the $50 expense a second thought. We started the lottery pool when I was 24 years old. It became a thing one Christmas morning, when we all realized that we were spending around $300 a month on lottery tickets already. Now, before you judge all of us, I want you to know that since we were young, our father had spent almost all of his paycheck on lottery tickets. We captured that same passion. 
but luckily for us, it was in a more moderate way. Joseph and I have always been the closest, since Paul and Jerry were both more than seven years older than us. Joseph and I only had a two-year gap between us. It meant that we argued and fought the most, but at the end of the day, we never complained about having to share a bunk bed with each other. No matter how much we argued that day, we would still talk to each other until we fell asleep every single night. We were the ones that actually got everything set up for the lottery pool and he was the one that convinced Jerry and Paul to join in, so that we could have a better chance. We made ourselves a few simple rules, in case we won, and how we would go about getting the tickets. Number one. We always used randomized numbers. Chance above luck. Number two. We would buy the tickets in a turn-based system. Jerry, Joseph, Paul, and then me. Number three. No matter who turned in the numbers, we would always split the winnings 25% each. Number four. If someone was unable to participate that week, they would not be included in the winnings. For ten years, we faced almost constant failure. The most we won was around $1,200. But if you added up all the money we'd spent until then, it felt like we were just throwing our money away. For some reason, we still kept doing it without any sort of hesitation. The person who was in charge for that week to purchase the tickets always found the $50 from each of the other people. So, ten years later, and I went into the convenience store that was right by my house, and purchased the 200 quick pick lottery tickets. That Wednesday, I sat in front of the TV while the numbers were being called. I wrote the numbers on a notepad and scanned through every single ticket. When I found one ticket that matched every single number and in the right order, I stared at the two pieces of paper. I checked the ticket over a hundred times just to make sure that the ticket I was holding in my hand was the impossible goal my brothers and I were shooting for. I called all of them within ten minutes, and within an hour, all of them were standing in front of me staring at the lottery ticket. Paul asked me if I was pranking them, but I convinced him that I really wasn't. Jerry's whole body was shaking with what seemed like absolute excitement and Joseph walked up to me and gave me a hug while telling me that all of our lives would finally get better. We all decided that the cash option would be the best for us to split it equally. And once we got the cash, the first thing we did was split four ways on a new house for our mother and father. I have never seen them so happy than the day that we surprised them with their new house. My father fell into tears while trying to explain how much it meant to him, while my mother gave each of us hugs while telling us how great we were to them. With all this newfound money, life was great to me until a month and a half later, when Paul was found floating in his outdoor pool. His neck had been sliced open with the head of a rubber duck poking out of his open neck. Joseph came over to my house the next day to deliver the news. And when I heard about it, I just wanted to cry over the loss of Paul. We may not have been close, but he was the one that always made sure we did our homework and that we made good decisions. Every time any of us thought about doing something reckless, Paul wouldn't try to stop us but he would try to talk to us and tell us that he thought what we were doing was absolutely foolish. The paranoia didn't really sink in until the death of Jerry two months later. He was found in the middle of our local park, clutching a rubber duck. His stomach was ripped open with both of his feet stuck into his midsection. He had been dead for eight hours before someone noticed that there was a dead body on the park bench. The day after Jerry's dead body was found in the park, 
I notice that Joseph has stopped talking to me altogether. Just to make sure, I texted him over ten times and called him three times, but I never got a response. I remembered playing with ducks with Joseph in the bathtub when we were younger and took baths together. I remember that Jerry and Paul would always make fun of us for playing with such childish toys in the bath, but we were never really affected by their taunts. I didn't want to think it was Joseph actually killing both of our brothers, but I didn't really have any other person to blame. I know I didn't do it, and I know that we claimed the lottery winnings anonymously, so all of my worry was on Joseph. I know that we were family, but you don't know what people will do for that extra bit of money. We all had more than enough money to live off, but obviously Joseph didn't think it was enough for him. For the next two weeks, I double-checked everything I did and everywhere I went. I was filled with paranoia, since I knew that Joseph knew where I usually liked to go and what I liked to do. I kept staying vigilant until yesterday. Yesterday, I woke up to the news of Joseph's death. He was found with a knife cut from his neck to the bottom of his midsection. The bottom half of a rubber duck was stapled to his stomach, and the top half of the rubber duck was sewn over his lips. There were two words cut into his forehead. Little Ducky. When I heard the news of his death, my blood ran cold, and I found myself filling with an overwhelming sense of panic. Little Ducky. That's exactly what my mother used to call us. Hmm. Was that a case of keeping your friends close, but your enemies closer? <laughs> no one can be trusted in Darktail. So, on to our final tale this evening. A man, unhappy with the appearance of his home, decides to do a little bit of decoration, but not in the way that most of us would imagine. I walk past the noose in my living room, every day. It's been dangling from a hook I've hammered into the ceiling, over the coffee table. For four months, I've walked past it every morning as I leave the house, and every evening when I come back from work. Learning how to fashion the thing was easy. I almost couldn't believe how many DIY videos were on YouTube. I made mine with an extension cord. I didn't hang the noose to kill myself. Not then. Really, I just wanted it up there for comfort. To have a reminder that there was something there that would let me escape everything if the time came where I needed to. It was like having a radio that you never played. Or a chair you never sat on. It was just there. A piece of furniture waiting to be used. Things have been not so good for a while. Not finding a lot of fulfillment at my job. Haven't spoken to any friends in God knows how long. But worst of all, my wife started cheating on me earlier this year. The guy she cheated with is in his twenties. Bartender from in town. Fella at least had the decency to wait until I left the house to fuck her. But they still made it pretty obvious to the neighbours. She would scream loudly, I've been told. Her and I hadn't made love in over three years. Hell, he only even spoke to one another maybe once or twice a week. On the day that I found out, when some sheepish neighbour took me out for a drink and broke the news to me, I put up the noose. I did it while she was sitting on the couch watching TV. She said nothing as I stood up on the coffee table, hammered the hook into the ceiling, and draped the knot extension cord over it. I stepped down, looked at her, gave a little smile, and left the room. 
Not one word was said. The two of us walked past the noose every day for the next few months. Sometimes I'd find her staring at it, concerned. But she never said anything to me. Her demeanor towards me became a lot friendlier. We started talking more often. One night we even had sex. It was passionless and neither of us finished. But hey, it was something. Neighbors told me Mr. Hotshot Bartender was still coming over. But less frequently now. There was a different kind of screaming going on whenever he was over. Constant arguing. Things weren't going so good with them. I just went about my business, but always focusing on the noose. <laughs> Soon, I kept thinking to myself. <laughs> Soon. Ah. <sighs> All the neighbors, God bless them, sent me letters telling me to keep strong, that my wife was in the wrong, to consider leaving her and finally finding happiness. All sorts of nice things were said, how I didn't deserve her, how she was a terrible person, how I shouldn't let this get me down. But even being surrounded by all this kindness, nothing comforted me as much as the noose did. It was a guiding light for me, a sign of comfort. It still is, even more so now. One day, I'm sure I'll use it. <sighs> I'll have to cut the wife down from there first, though. She's been keeping it warm for me since she found all those nice letters. I walk past the noose every day. Well, my dear friends, I thank you for once again joining me on this voyage through Darktown. I hope you enjoyed those three tales. If you did, and you haven't listened to our previous two journeys, make sure you do. I'm linking to them at the end of this video. Well, that's all for me for tonight. See you all again real soon. But for now, 